Good evening, everyone. Uh, hello to those of you remarkably in the room uh, in our uh, moderately responsible, physically distanced, uh, as COVID careful as we can be while still being back to something approximating regular life uh, room here at New York University. I'm Eric Kleinenberg. I'm the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge and uh, I'm delighted to be here again after all this time. This is our second uh, live in-person event and we're still, you know, warming up to the concept, uh, but uh, my heart warms being here. It just feels much better than it, it does uh, speaking to all of you from my bedroom, uh, which is where I spent most of the last couple of years, probably with you also, it, your own bedrooms, of course. Um, uh, tonight's a, a great night. We love to do um, book celebrations here that are at once kind of celebratory and also critical because, uh, Everyone here who's part of the academic tribe knows that the way that we celebrate is by uh, telling each other what's wrong with the work that we do. Uh, and so we you know, promise to engage in, in, in some of that here this evening. Um, we have a new book from one of uh, our IPK fellows and really close collaborators over the years, uh, Marita Sturkin, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Media, Culture and Communication at NYU and also associate faculty at the Department of Cinema Studies at the Tisch School of the Arts. Uh, Marita, bless her, was the department chair uh, here for many years, uh, a, a editor of uh, a journal for many years, and so, so she is clearly headed for sainthood at some point. Uh, but, but tonight, um, she's going to talk to us about a darker topic, um, one which kind of receded into the background these last couple of years as we've been dealing with uh, pandemics and racial injustice and climate crises and things that felt like they had more burning urgency, uh, but lo and behold, uh, in the last 24 hours, we've been taken back here in New York City to the theme uh, of, of Marita's recent book, which is uh, violence. Uh, Marita's book is called Terrorism in American Memory, Memorials, Museums, and Architecture in the Post-9-11 Era. Uh, it is uh, published by New York University Press. And for those of you who are watching on Zoom, uh, hopefully in the chat, you will see a link to a place where you can buy the book at a discount. And for those of you who are IPK regulars, you know that the norm here is always that we, you know, we have these big celebrations with food and wine and good things. And we just ask that everybody leaves the, the place with a book that they purchase. So the booksellers don't have to do that. And we can't make that demand of you here tonight because the celebration's gone. But if you're, if you're here online, please uh, check out a copy of Marita's book. Um, so Marita is gonna speak for about 20 minutes and tell us, um, uh, you know, the kind of big ideas here. And then we have two terrific uh, uh, speakers coming to talk uh, uh, about the book. First, uh, Sarah Williams Goldhagen, uh, who is a former Harvard professor and uh, uh, kind of eminent writer on uh, the built environment. Her most recent book is Welcome to Your World, How the Built Environment Shapes Our Lives uh, from HarperCollins, which was translated in many languages and won a, a Nautilus Book Award in 2017 for its contribution to social and environmental justice. Uh, and Sarah, really happy to have you here for, at IPK for I believe the first time. Uh, after Sarah, we have another uh, IPK uh, veteran, uh, Harvey Malich, who's a professor emeritus of sociology at New York University and also at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, he is one of our great uh, writers on cities and the built environment as well. And his many books include uh, the, the classic Urban Fortunes as well as uh, more relevant for today's conversation, Against Security, How We Go Wrong at Airports, Subways, and Other Sites of Ambiguous Danger. So the way this will work is uh, after the panel discussion, uh, we'll let the panelists speak to each other a little bit, and then we'll take questions from you in the audience here in person, as well as from you on Zoom. And uh, I have my computer here so I can get your questions. Uh, we'll end in about an hour at six o'clock. So with that, Wonderful to get going. And uh, Marita, I, I pass the mic to you. Thank you. Uh, I really want to thank my good friend, Eric Kleinenberg, for inviting me to do this, and everyone at IPK, uh, Jessica, Victor, Zari, for putting this together. And I'd like to thank NYU Press, uh, including Eric Zinner, for. Um, making the book uh, into a real thing, um, and my colleagues at MCC uh, as well. 
I really want to thank Harvey and Sarah because some of my favorite quotes in the book uh, come from them. Uh, quotes that share a kind of articulate outrage, for instance, on the travesty of the rebuilding of Ground Zero. So what I'm just going to trace a few arguments of the book, hopefully to give um, you a sense of its aims and uh, uh, and I'm gonna race through some slides uh, in the process. So uh, next. So this is a book about memory, the politics of memorialization, the preoccupation with memory that really shaped the last 20 years. And I argue that by looking at how we've memorialized traumatic events over the last two decades, that can provide insights into how identity has, national identity has been shaped and is changing. How about if I just... <laughs> and how we, this is really about how, how did we get to the precipice of history where we are situated today? Who we memorialize as a nation and who we do not is enormously revealing of how we define ourselves as a nation and empire. 9-11 produced an excess of memorialization. I'm just giving you a sense of the many memorials here. Uh, more than 1,200 9-11 memorials are scattered around the country, a few around the world, many incorporating the steel of the Twin Towers and built more than 15 years later. This surfeit of memory is a clear indication that this memorialization was about more than memory. Rather, I think it re reflected a desire to return to that post 9-11 moment of national unity in which, however falsely, the nation seemed to speak with one voice. I wanna argue that the post 9-11 era uh, can be defined as the era in which 9-11, the event and all that followed in its wake, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the changed legal and security norms, the US crimes of torture and illegal detention was the primary shaping force of US society, a culture of nationalism, unexamined patriotism, revenge, xenophobia, securitization that persisted even through the Obama years. But I also wanna argue that the post 9-11 era began to fade in recent years and can be seen as having ended by 2020 when the crisis of the pandemic shifted into a new era with a different set of needs, demands, and motivating factors, a different structure of feeling that is still undefined, but is framed more by political polarization and internal conflict, by increased demands for social justice and a backlash to them, by debates over race and memory. 9-11 exceptionalism, which defined it as a unique, was which defined 9-11 as a unique event with no parallels in history, allowed the US to maintain a narrative of innocence. But in this new era, such a narrative cannot hold. While 9-11 memorialization has been a nationalist project, many of the art projects and memorial proposals of the post 9-11 wars in Iraq and Afghanistan aim to address the sacrifice loss and appalling devastation of those wars and to work against their erasure from public view in America. A new era of memory activism is also most clearly seen in the recent op recently opened National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, which memorializes those killed by lynching. Okay, thank you. It's revealing that Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative that built the memorial and its legacy museum felt that memorialization was a key avenue toward raising public awareness of the legacy of lynching. The challenge and demand of the lynching memorial is for the nation to change rather than to remain innocent. This is a statue at the memorial. And these are jars of soil uh, taken um, from sites uh, of lynchings. This book is about different ways in which terrorism and its effects have been memorialized. And as such, it aims to address how terrorism, which has historically been understood 
as a force that is visited upon the US from outside, a foreign threat, has actually been an active force within the nation and of the state throughout American history. In the 9-11 context, terrorism was defined as a threat to the American way of life. Yet the lynching memorial and the legacy museum make the argument that Amer the American history of white supremacy has deployed terrorism from the origins of the nation with the genocide of Native Americans and the legacy of slavery in, that it remains in the racial terrorism of lynching and segregation and in the mass incarceration of blacks today. These new forms of memory activism thus aim to rewrite the national script, to redefine terrorism as having a long history in the American way of life. New York was the epicenter of the violence of 9-11, and despite the enormous number of memorials elsewhere, New York is clearly the epicenter of 9-11 memory with its national memorial and museum. I note that 9-11 is a story of terrorism. It is also a story of architecture. The Twin Towers were targeted as architectural symbols and the debates over how to rebuild Lower Manhattan made clear the burden on architecture to produce adequate symbols of renewal while meeting demands by realtors for equivalent amounts of office space. In the book, I examine how high-end celebrity architecture can be complicit in the neoliberal transformation of cities and in the squandering of public funds. But I'm also interested in the powerful role that architecture and design can play both in memorial design and in projects of social justice, like the lynching memorial and museum. 20 years later, and in a very different era, a generation later, how can we make sense of what has been built at the site of Ground Zero? An oversized memorial of two large black granite pools of cascading water surrounded by a lackluster, almost military plaza, a highly securitized space that is a kind of anti public space. The memorial pools actually kind of suck the space out of the plaza, and there are almost no places to, to sit. Uh, and the site is separated from the city by security bollards. I, I think we're a little ahead, I'm a little ahead of myself here. A huge museum to the event of 9-11 filled with artifacts, video, photographs, audio. The museum does certain things quite well, like tell the story of 9-11 in New York in particular, but it ultimately is unable to situate the event in relation to the larger historical context. And it is effectively anti-Muslim in the story it tells. It is also a hugely expensive enterprise. Uh, with uh, a crass gift shop. Mm -hmm. One World Trade Center, a banal skyscraper with a clunky antenna top heavily securitized at its base that is intended to anchor the skyline as the Twin Towers once did. That it was once called the Freedom Tower and is built to 1776 feet is now meaningless. A dramatic yet kitschy building by Santiago Calatrava. So let's go for it. There's the security bollards. That functions as a transportation hub and shopping mall that cost an astounding $4 billion. Okay. Several banal glass office towers designed by high-end architects with shopping malls in them. The price tag for this in total was $25 billion, the vast majority of it from public funds. So the rebuilding represents a huge transfer of public funds to the private sector and a huge failure of design imagination. Of course, the folly of the rebuild Ground Zero has not only been made more so by the changes wrought on the city by the pandemic, which makes large office buildings look obsolete and a hugely expensive museum for global tourists out of step. The museum has become the subject of debate about its relevance a mere seven years after its opening. I hinge much of my argument here on the Calatrava building because it is in many ways, it provides the central symbolism for the rebuilding of Ground Zero. It was presented by the architect as an almost religiously inspired building and greeted at its announcement 
uh, as a building that re renew the city, its design meant to evoke birds in flight. Yet the building has ultimately come to symbolize a kind of crass form of renewal in its Instagram ready design, its tourist magnetism, and as a cathedral shopping mall, its embrace of consumerism. In the absence of any meaningful public space, we are greeted in the rebuilt ground zero with the message that shopping tells us that life goes on. Oh, it's sideways, rats. This is an image that was sent to be my, my colleague, Ben Kafka of the ground zero at Legoland. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Sarah. Can you hear me? Got it. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Um, Marita, as you were speaking, and as I was reading the book, I was, I kept an image kept coming to mind, which is when my kids were young, we would have these TV nights, and we would like expose them to all sorts of things. And whenever violence came on the TV, we used to tell them to plug their ears and close their eyes and go do 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 like block everything out. And I think that um, looking at your images again and remembering writing about this uh, has that thing. The book is fabulous. And um, I there are a couple of things I want to point out about it. Um, it. Contrary, Eric, to your introduction, I'm actually not going to say negative things. I'm going to say nice things, uh, which is to, to give the audience a sense of how difficult a topic this is to write about. Um, and what, when I, I actually encountered this topic when I was working on an architect who designed the Capitol complex in Bangladesh, which was at the time that he was designing it, East Pakistan. Uh, and so it was very self-consciously a symbol of national identity. Uh, and then suddenly it was a different country. Uh, and so there was constant discussions about meaning, how buildings communicate and narrate meanings of national identity. Uh, and, and can they do that? And uh, I delved into it more and I ultimately came to the conclusion now belied by your book that I had nothing to say <laughs> um, because it was such a difficult topic. And the reason it's such a difficult topic is because it's effectively a reader response problem. Um, in the sense that you have this object, and then if it's a large building, you have the people who design the object, the people who use the object, the people for whom it's intended, you have the people for whom it's not necessarily intended, but who run into it anyway. And then you have all those same sets of audiences passing over time. And um, memorial is that the project of memorialization is almost always a failed project uh, because uh, two generations out, nobody cares. Uh, and so, and in the World Trade Center, in the museum and in the memorial and the building and so on, they tried so hard to like hold on to these memories. Uh, and that I think is one of the problems uh, of the, I mean, there are a lot of problems. We can go into them, but um, particularly the 9-11 museum, which you spend, devote a whole chapter to. The, the problem in that is, as you very rightly point out, a problem of over-specification. It's like enslaved to those people and those moments. And that's not what cultural memory is about. Uh, cultural memory has to be about larger themes and themes that last over time. Um, and you interestingly bring up, because you go through all of these different memorials, the issue of 
abstraction versus representation, uh, which I think is a really important issue to discuss because it's, this, is, this is not the last set of tragic events that are going to be uh, memorialized in some way or another. And what's, what's the best way to do that? Do you have my slide? Okay, could you put that up? Okay. Um, well, actually first, go back, go back again first back. Actually, yeah, you can keep on that. Okay, so there were floods and floods of proposals um, when, right after 9-11 for what should be done with this space. And Larry Silverstein, who's the one who owned the lease to the land, basically did a land grab and um, milked the process for as much money as he could in a way that was really disgusting and was obvious that it was going on at the time. Um, hence the response, hence the mediocrities and, and monstrosities that we have at the site today. Um, but I thought one of the most brilliant proposals was this one, which was by Raphael Vignoli and a group of a consortium of architects. It was something called like the Museum of Hope, or I mean, it was sort of a monument to hope. And it was just this scaffolding with a few public spaces scattered through, including gardens at the top and a cafe and so on and so forth. And it, a, a really delicate light-handed way to, and an abstract way to say something happened here that's not here anymore and you can come and use this too. And so it opens itself up to lots and lots of different kinds of meanings. Um, Okay, and just go to the next one quickly. I just want to, sh one thing I'll point out. So this on the right is an earlier iteration of the Calatrava Oculus um, uh, monstrosity. And you can see they made, among the modifications they made the architects do was to build these buildings to the specifications of US embassies abroad, right? And so they made Calatrava double the amount of struts um, that he put in the thing. And so, it, whereas this, you could, I can't stand Calistrava's architecture anyway, but um, you could sort of make a case that this might have been nice, right? But the way that it ended up being, I mean, it looks, people call it a stegosaurus. I think it actually looks like ruined parts of the old World Trade Center towers, you know, having kind of dropped to the ground. Um, anyway, I, I think I'll stop there because Harvey has things to say and then we can talk. Get our own. That's that's something else. So the third is I'm just not thinking in disease, uh, and I should be. So uh, thank you very much for uh, writing the book and for your comments. And um, it, and it it it's a remarkable book in part because of the uh, uh, it has wisdom and it has taste and it has discernment. Um, and it's a combination that um, uh, I'm a sociologist and uh, all three is virtually never found together. Uh, one is good and two is you're really on top of it. And we got, we've got three. One of the things that um, this uh, book does is it, 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 it tells us in a way it's a, um, an, ar an archeological uh, uh, expedition on the politics and culture of that moment and that historic time. And um, I read the book and have thought about the, um, what's happened at, on the 16 acres um, in those terms. So um, it, it, there's a methodology here. Um, and what does it tell us? Um, it, like always, it's, it's a kind of a very complicated assemblage of buy-ins of people going along, of uh, politically, uh, of uh, culturally, of spending money. Uh, um, it, it's all of the above. So um, we, we find America here. Um, and this book, I think, is written um, from, with that um, sort of orientation. And um, Marita can uh, take off or say no or whatever she wants. Um, but what we find is one of the terms that she is, is in the book and that she's used, I think, in prior work 
is script of, of the nation. Uh, and that, uh, that is what we have here in physical and ideological terms is uh, the, the script of America um, as people pitched in, and there was much talk of pitching in, uh, as they've uh, pitched in, and including the ideology of American exceptionalism, which Marita has also written about before, uh, the idea that exceptionalism, uh, not in the usual political science terms, but exceptionalism is in that um, we don't uh, do anything wrong in the world. Uh, and so if we get all the power and all the glory and all the armies, it's fine because we don't do anything wrong. Um, it's also um, e exceptionalism, we are never guilty. Uh, th th other people are do that. Um, and then something that is added here, um, I think, um, is the idea of comfort culture. Uh, and I really like that phrase and that wording that um, no matter what else happens, uh, Americans need to be comfortable. And uh, this project is filled with furniture and cushions um, and tchotchkes, um, uh, um, uh, coffee mugs uh, that are all about um, um, exhibiting and pursuing um, comfort, the obvious luxury of the buildings, including the Calatrava. Um, it's another tchotchke, it's a giant, uh, I'll eat you before you eat me, tchotchke. By the way, that's the way I, uh, um, that's my interpretation of, of, of the building. So the buy-ins are uh, heroic buildings, um, uh, words and monuments of the, of the time. Um, Maya Lin, who did that wonderful job, she, um, uh, she got us words, um, words of, of, de of the dead. Uh, and this then is on um, a prominent exhibition. So that's just uh, another, uh, like the other tchotchkes, that's uh, borrowed from uh, a wonderful site, I think, um, and then uh, uh, splayed uh, on here. And as Marita points out, with much predicament about how the, um, who's, whose names in what order and all that, it, it gets you right down to the uh, detail. There are special problems here uh, with all of it, with tchotchkes, with buy-ins and all of that. And that is, um, and I think it's a little bit different than what has been said already, which is that it, it's, a, as we used to say, a contradiction. That is, we're memorializing something that really, it, it, it's too early to memorialize it, but I always thought it was gonna be a flunker uh, because it isn't uh, the thing that's gonna be remembered. Um, it's not worth that. Um, it, it's just not good enough in terms of horror. Um, and the other horror memorials, like the Holocaust memorials, are to a point, um, and you very much make the point that there's no point, that it's, um, uh, it so that's why I disaggregate it to get the um, point in, in it um, and to excavate um, those little businesses so um, where, where do we end up? So it also um, is, is a fashion spot. And the, the fashion is the architectural fashions of the time, like the, the names and all of that and the Calatrava, and it was supposed to open and close uh, to be all automatic and uh, full of fabulous things like that. Um, and, um, uh, but what Marita really points out is that there is, um, uh, there's no context. It is um, only tchotchkes uh, and emotion. And the stuff that is really a success, which you point out, the voices of people who are about to die, man, that is powerful stuff. Um, but that's all there is, really. It's, it's the emotion without the lesson. Uh, and the, uh, it has been deliberately stripped of anything like contextual historical meaning. Um, and so that's why um, we're all left with that. And you may have said that while I was struggling to get in downstairs, um, but um, it, it's a big building and it's, it's, a, it's a big lie. Um, and I don't know if you said it, but that it's 1,776 feet, you did say that, but it is, um, uh, the top is nothing uh, and the bottom is nothing. It's, it's a void. And so it, in a way, 
um, I think that this records architecturally this lack of meaning with void at the top and void at the bottom uh, in order to be a PR success, uh, a somewhat of a tourist success. I don't think it's gonna last. I don't think it's gonna be good. So I think of it as in their own terms. So I think of it as um, another, uh, I've been reading Barbara Tuckman of all people in recent COVID days. Uh, it is uh, the March of Folly um, uh, with props. I want to follow up on that, which is to say that I think the one place where I did disagree with you, okay, so disagreements do come out, uh, is in the Pentagon Memorial, which I actually think is very successful. And the reason, here are the reasons I think it's successful is that it, it's quite abstract, number one. I mean, it has the names of the people, but when you're there, you don't even really notice those names, right? It's spread out along a field, so it has a sense of you have to move through it, you pass time to get through it and get some sense of it. So you get a sense of the scale of it. And these benches are not aligned with one another. So if you sit on one, you can't sit and talk to another person. You're by yourself. Uh, and you're sitting over water with you know, this kind of elemental, you're cantilevered precariously over this element this basic element of water on the earth. And so the reason I think it's successful is because it phenomenologically instantiates the sense of isolation that a tragedy brings. Uh, it's the only 9-11 memorial that I thought was even remotely successful. And I think that's why, so. Uh, thank you both. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in maybe saying, hearing you say a little bit more, both of you, about security design and, and how, how those security fears and concerns, like there's architecture, and then in a context like this, security professionals are brought in and everything is changed. The memorial, the buildings, everything changed, right? And then we have and, and it really is the security consultancy phase that eliminated any possibility of public space, any possibility of street life, of, of storefronts, whatever, right? And, and even though there had been, of course, um, you know, many, many events of getting public opinion and lots of lip service to, to the public, right? And, and are we sort of stuck in that? Will we be able to move past the security phase of design, do you think? I, I, I'm not so sure I would say it was just the security that ruined. There are okay, a lot of sure. things that ruined these, <laughs> yeah, <sites> okay. <laughs> these buildings. <laughs> yeah. Security was one of them. But if you take, for example, the, Amer the new American embassy in London mm -hmm. by Karen Timberlake, I don't mm -hmm. know if you know the building, mm -hmm. but same security specifications, crazy stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, so they solved it by basically doing a slab. I mean, it was a very straightforward kind mm -hmm. of slab. And then they made a really beautiful landscape park mm -hmm. around it that anybody can go into after you pass through these things. And so they gave the building the space so nobody can drive a truck into it and explode it and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. But they gave you public space. Mm -hmm. So it was a series of bad decisions mm -hmm based on commercial decisions right. and, and dumb politicians' ideas mm -hmm. and right. all sorts of things. It wasn't the security per se, although the security per se mm -hmm. definitely ruined mm -hmm. One World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, it's also the case that the whole event was treated as uh, security. That is, it isn't just the site. Mm -hmm. It's um, uh, America, and they're not going to do this shit to us again. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was macho. Mm -hmm. uh, from day one mm -hmm. in terms of response. And plenty of things I think have been built since mm -hmm. then uh, with less security. Mm -hmm. um, I have one slide. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, uh, this is uh, my favorite monument in New York. Um, and you all may know it, it's only blocks from here. 
Um, and uh, George, uh, Siegel is the, um, uh, the sculptor. All his work is always just smaller than life size. So it is a deliberate diminution. Uh, and it is ordinary people in interaction uh, in front of the stone wall, which you, you see on the, on the other side, uh, as opposed to the, the, do I have it? Oh yeah, as opposed to the general for whom the square is named done in typical 19th century, early 20th century heroic fashion. So at 9-11 uh, at the memorial, that's what we've got. We've got more the general thing than we have the four people saying hello to each other. Um, and, and on speed, I mean, the, you know, it's, it's not enough to have a general with a sword. It's a, it, the whole thing is a general with a sword. And it's kind of spectacular vista uh, of the pools, their size, their oversize. Oh, it's the whole thing. <laughs> you're, you're not going to get us again. Uh -huh. and, and hence the overbuilding uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, that was built into uh -huh. it, um, you know, double, triple that uh -huh. you, you point right. out in the book. I, I just want to pick up on one other thing that you said, Harvey, which is about the whole question of comfort and how we as Americans sort of demand to be comfortable uh, all the time. And the, it really, part of why I wanted to end the book with the uh, lynching memorial and museum in, in Montgomery is because it, it, it really, really pushes back at that, right? And, and they're very explicit. We want people who come here to experience discomfort and then to sit with that discomfort and I think design-wise, that's a really, really hard thing to achieve, right? And so one of the things, back to your question of abstraction and representation, right? One of the things that the memorial does with these hanging columns that are meant or allegorically stand in for the hanging bodies, right? But they're not figurative, which is really important. Um, I think that, they, they make you uncomfortable as a visitor once, you, once they're, you're walking down and they're really hanging over you. And, and then you are kind of, you're still in the memorial and you have to kind of manage your discomfort and try and make sense of it. And I think the design is particularly successful at evoking bodies without using the figure which is of course increasingly problematic. And that's why I put in that slide there of the sculpture that's on the grounds there of a slave family because aesthetically it's really in contrast to uh, the memorial and it tends actually to get a lot more media play <laughs> than the images of the memorial. Okay, so I'm gonna... Um join the conversation and ask you all to start thinking about your questions and remind those of you watching on Zoom to um, send yours in as well. We already have a few that, that have come in. It, it's, um, it's especially charged for us to have this conversation here at the Institute for Public Knowledge because as you know, um, the next kind of big act of violence to hit New York after S September 11th was Sandy, uh, a kind of climate violence and a, and a man-made one at that. Uh, and IPK entered the story because in the aftermath of Sandy, there was a uh, Obama administration effort called Rebuild by Design to try to generate ideas for how you rebuild, not, not how you build memorials, but how you rebuild structures and infrastructures to look forward for the 21st century. And the tenet of this um, project was that design works best when it's uh, collaborative, when it's participatory, when it's democratic, uh, and there was a, a year long process with um, all kinds of outreach to hundreds of communities and stakeholders from top to bottom um, that resulted in designs that were different than the ones that I think the participants in the project who are the same set of architects and engineering firms, by the way, um, would have done on their own. And so I wanted to start by asking you to talk a little bit more about this democratic process that went into the early stages of the post 9-11 response, because as we all remember, there, there was quite an elaborate set of meetings um, 
thousands of people participated. Um, it, it was, some people have written about it as a, a, at least a performance of democracy uh, and possibly as something that seemed more substantive, seemed like it was possibly going to be more substantive. So could you just remind us what happened when people came together to talk about what to do with the site and uh, how did it come out this way? I'm going to say a few things that maybe you want to say. Well, I, I think that um, there was an explosion of uh, design imagination beginning in the beginning, not only through the public process, but also through uh, architects informally, formally, lots of competitions, lots of, lots of, um, imaginings of the site, uh, and many of which were kind of bold, I would say a lot of which were impractical, but they were still really interesting ways of, of thinking about it. I, I would say, and I don't want to spend too much time on the politics of it, which of course has been much written about, but um, the, the city of New York actually had very little control over anything that happened, right? It was the state, was the, let's not forget, the Port Authority was a major player, right? It was the governor, especially Governor Pataki, right? And then uh, real estate developers who managed uh, through Larry Silverstein and, uh, you know, to hold on to the power of what was going to be rebuilt. And that is kind of a story of New York City, right? Which is the outsized power that real estate developers have in this city in, in particular. And so um, I, I think and then kind of hand in hand, I think, with architects. So, so I mean, I actually had an architect who worked on the museum tell me, you know, the public discussion, you know, we put it in a drawer and that's where it stayed. That's effectively what happened. I mean, it was a charade of public participation actually. And it was, I was actually working as a journalist at the time. I was at the, uh, at the press conference where Daniel Liebskin presented his initial thing. And it, it, I mean, Marie just got it exactly right. Basically, the people, the public did not own that property. And the way that American property ownership happens is that it would have been fantastically expensive for us to take over and turn that into public land, which is what should have happened. You wouldn't need the whole site. But um, to have not have allowed basically commercial interests to drive what was going on and then keep holding all these meetings as if the public had a say. In fact, there is one sector of the public that did have a say, and that was the families. And um, like most people get a memorial. There's no question that what, ha what happened to them was horrible my humble opinion, they don't necessarily get that huge a memorial. Um, because, you know, again, it's the problem of memorialization that I just keep coming up against and against and again. It's like, nobody's going to care two generations down the line who those people were. You know, yes, though, families care, and they should care, and they get to have some kind of memorial. But who knows who that golden guy is on 59th Street and Fifth Avenue. Can anyone in the audience tell me who that guy is, the equestrian statue? Schwartz. General Sherman, okay. The guy who actually did, sort of invented scorched earth policies in the Civil War, okay? So it's, that's a long answer. Do you wanna add something, Harvey? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I differ on death. Um, because if you look at the, across the world and how people memorialize or deal with death, the Americans is one specialty. Um, and uh, we put up little monuments, but we put up more monuments, we're, we're do that. Um, and uh, uh, people die all the time. Uh, and we've all, all of us in this room uh, have been part of people's death. And, and we don't make public things about it. Those people went to work. I mean, that was basically what they did. And they, then we had the whole thing about the heroes and then we all had to mourn them. Let me ask a, one more question and then I wanna open it up. Um, I'm 
Sorry, I just oh. I do just have to say something. Okay. I do want to say that this was the largest attack on American soil in American history. And it was a genocide, pure and simple. And so it's not like it's not like your grandmother keeling over when she's going marketing. There is something about it that needs to be worked through memory wise. Could you clarify what you mean by genocide? I'm sorry. Uh, those people were killed. They just went to work, right? They were secretaries and whoever they were, they went to work. They were, they were slaughtered because they represented a corporate identity that people didn't like. That's, a, that's sort of the definition of what a genocide is. Yeah, of national identity. Here's, here's my other follow-up. Um, I could be wrong about this, but I recall for, that for years, this site was the most popular tourist destination in New York. I, I read somewhere that Woodbury Commons Mall had overtaken it, and that seems exactly right. Um, how do you how do you account for its popularity, or how how, how should we interpret what, what what should we make of its popularity? I I think that people are really drawn toward. Um, having some kind of physical contact with sites of violence. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I do a whole analysis of the gift shop and I try to also try and make sense there of why someone would go and buy something at the gift shop. And there is this desire to take away something from sites that are meaningful. To me, it's the same reason why we have all these thousands of 9-11 memorials in places like Laguna Beach, California. I mean, like what, what, what possible connection is there um, uh, using these pieces of steel that the Port, the Port Authority had a hangar full of steel and it, this was a really good way to get rid of some of it. And they handed it out and it was seen to be very, very meaningful. And there was all these little towns that wanted to have that as some kind of connection to the meaning of this uh, event, right? And so to me, that is on one hand that it's, it was in a spectacular event of violence. It was a shocking event for Americans. And then on the other hand, I, I do think that that was also about the sense of unity in the aftermath, the firefighters, the sense of America sort of taking care of itself, right? All of which papered over the fact that the event itself showed that we were very vulnerable and very weak, right? And so I, I think that that there, there is the tourism in New York, which started right in the beginning, was about that sense that, that this is a very, very meaningful place in the, not simply in the city, but in the nation. And as it has become sort of finished and, and kitchified, I, I think that, that kind of tourism that's happening there is quite different than when it was where people were really going to sort of look over the fence and see the destruction or see the hole uh, in the ground. Let's open it up. Does anyone in the room have a question? Yeah, hold on. Lisa, I'm gonna hand you the mic. Yeah, thanks so much, you guys. This is great. Um, and I enjoyed reading the book. And, you know, I think we took an architecture tour together. Um, but I have a question just, you know, apropos of these last comments about um, war uh, and about um, torture um, as the kind of background into this period where memorialization is being acted out um, in, in, in its diminishing form. So how does that, you know, sort of inform your process of writing in the book, but also for what you you see in the eventual memorialization. Thank you. Um, so I think the hyper memorialization of 9-11 helped a lot in the erasure of the wars, the costs of the wars. Uh, you know, who are the people that need security? It's the people in Baghdad, it's the people in Kabul, right? Hundreds of thousands of people whose, whose deaths are not acknowledged within our national script, right? And I have to say for, for me, um, writing about, so there's a, a lot of these art projects, which I showed a few of uh, about the memory of the war. There is now a movement toward making a, a memorial on the mall called the 
global war, the war, the memorial for global terrorism, I think, the global war on terror, right? Um, and I, I just, for me, that was the hardest chapter to write because it was the most depressing uh, because the stories of, of American uh, uh, veterans of those wars, uh, what, what's happened to them, how, how many of them are disabled, how many have committed suicide, how many uh, have just been erased from this story uh, is very, it's very painful. And, and, uh, and that, that then on top of our inability to see how those wars and destabilized uh, the Middle East and had this kind of cascading effect, right? Which all of which is connected to what we're struggling with today in the same way that the non 11 nationalism fed into the right and the rise of Trump, right? Those wars also fed into this xenophobia and then this um, really this uh, broader destabilization on a global scale, right? And that's a story we have not reckoned with clearly uh, as a nation. So we have many questions that have come in online, but before we get there, I, did I see another hand here? Yeah, Melina, hold on. Um, thank you so much for this talk. I'm Melina, by the way. We met one time in your apartment. I was there with Sarah Benet Weiser, and so it's good to see you again. Um, but I'm just wondering, I was thinking about this, this uh, problem of the erasure of context, similar to what you were just talking about in, in answering the last question um, of the war and everything like that. And this erasure of context, is this a problem that you think is relatively specific to the 9-11 memorial? Or is this a problem that a lot of museums, memorials, et cetera, have to contend with? Um, I was just thinking about the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. And while I thought that museum was very provocative and very disturbing and, and did a good job in a lot of ways, it really kind of erased you know, the delayed entrance of the United States into World War II and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's kind of what I'm wondering. I don't think this is exclusive to the United States, but I think we have here a very powerful example of how this functions. And I think the way I would get at this is to, to look for just briefly at how the museum deals with this, right? So one of the problems of the story of 9-11 is that it's told as a story of one day, right? And that's very powerful narrative wise. And when the museum does that, it, it's very powerful and moving, right? Uh, but then once it's defined, the event itself is defined as one day rather than uh, an attack that then, well, produced 20 years and more, right? Uh, of, of war, of violence, of torture, of destabilization, right? Um, we can't, we have, we, we can't sort of privilege the story of that day in, in the same way. We can't say those people who died that day are more important than those people who died uh, afterwards. And in the museum, uh, they have a lot about the sort of recovery effort. And then they have one room, one room that, that has next to nothing about um, the wars in, in, in the Middle East and, and Abu Ghraib. I don't think Abu Ghraib is even mentioned actually. And, and then boom, you come out into the foundation hall where you get to see the brick from the compound in Abbottabad where um, Osama bin Laden was assassinated, right? No historical, ex I mean, it, he's barely even mentioned, right? In the aftermath part, right? So, so uh, the museum is trying to say that it's telling the story of the meaning of 9-11, but it has to historically contextualize it if it's going to do that. And there, I think it really does, uh, a tremendous uh, disservice. And part of the reason why that happens is because it is really a memorial museum, right? And the memorial part of the museum looms over the historical part of the museum and clearly 
made them very timid in a certain sense on how they would tell that story. So, yeah. So we have lots of questions that have come in on Zoom. And what I'm going to do for those of you watching at home uh, is forward them on to you. So if you want to engage later, you can, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you a few now. Uh, the first is from Matteo Tausig Rubo, who says, uh, in my memory of September 11th in New York, there was so much openness, people gathering in parks, talking to strangers. Of course, there were some negative experiences too. But what strikes me about the memorialization is how it shut down and stabilized what in the immediate aftermath was a very interesting uncertainty. Uh, and, and he'd like to know if you think memorials can do otherwise. Maybe it seems like my take on Sarah's comments is that something more abstract invites a variety of interpretations. Not so. only can they, but should they? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, but it, it is not an easy thing to do, I should say. Like, you know, everybody points to Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorials, and it really is one of the few successful memorials, and it is because it is almost completely abstract. It has a phenomenological component. You actually descend into the ground in this gash in the earth, and it's a very visceral experience. And then, and then you just have these names incised in it. And all you know is these guys died. You know, so there are, and that part of the reason I went through all these different audiences, because you're speaking to so many different audiences and different audiences over time, it's a really hard thing to yeah. do well. So Shamika Mitchell has a question that's also a comment. Um, and, and Shamika says, just a few blocks from the September 11th Memorial is the African burial ground, which is a national memorial site. Can anyone speak to the difference of the African burial ground as a site of remembrance and national identity? Hmm. I'm reading that one. That's a really hard question. Um, I, I, and I know that the, there's been, uh, some vandalism at, at the site and and uh, and it's tucked away. And I mean, so, I mean, what, what can we see there? We can see the different ways in which we tell our national story and the, the a burial ground of, of uh, African-Americans is, is shuttered away in a way that it's very, I mean, there is a, an exhibit there, but it's shuttered it away in a way that we, it shows how we have not confronted that history. Well, can I just say, I think the 9-11 is, is celebrated. I think it is our catastrophe that is a celebration of catastrophe. And, uh, and the African um, a burial ground is not. And it's, I think, the same old story, but in greatly magnified uh, terms. So uh, Elka Heckner asks, well, she says, it strikes me that the idea of an architectural void is an important concept as it signifies absence through the space of the voids, such as in Liebskin's Jewish Museum. Did you imply this concept of void, this concept of void, or did you mean to evoke void in the sense of nothingness? This is an important distinction. So if you meant void in the first sense, this would speak to the significance of how to represent absence and loss. I think we should not necessarily trivialize the concept of the architectural void in representing trauma, catastrophe, and loss. Yeah, I would. I do have a whole sort of engagement with the question of the void in in the book, and uh, I do think that it can be designed in effective ways. I think that that's kind of. It doesn't have that same effect in the memorial pools in part because they are so oversized and they're oversized because they were built in the footprints of the original towers, which doesn't, which were understood to be kind of sacred in the, in the, in the aftermath of 9-11 in ways that were never questioned uh, and should have been. Uh, and then I think the fact that they were turned into these kind of waterfall pools also makes the void effect less effective. <laughs> so uh, Patrick Deere uh, says that one of the striking things about the post 9-11 forever war era is that it doesn't have a distinct or clearly defined domestic home front, unlike other previous wars. Can you all reflect on what these 9-11 memorials and museums say about the spaces of the so-called homeland? Uh, 
Um, I said it. Tell me what I said. <laughs> Look, I, I, I just I'm going to be a broken record here a little bit, which is I, I think that um, I fundamentally don't think that architecture is a narrative art. I think it sucks at storytelling. OK, and I think that that's part of what the story you tell in the way that they tried to like pull stories out of the museum, but you can't, it just doesn't, it's not the medium to do that, okay? And so when you're referring to things like American identity or national identity, that's a story. And I don't think that architecture, I don't think you can make that stick very well. I think that's part of what my kind of the subtext of everything I'm trying to say. So it, I'm not parrying the answer. I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to answer it. I'm thinking, Patrick, that the, the concept of the homeland that was such a part of the post 9-11 era, how, uh, it would be really interesting to sort of think through how that might have changed in the context of COVID and, and Trump and, and, and become a less coherent kind of trope. Last question, because it's almost, well, it was already a little over six, but we're gonna go a couple minutes late. There's a series of questions about this idea of comfort politics. Um, and one question concerns how and to what extent it represses trauma. Uh, one anonymous questioner says, one of the arguments of Robert J. Lifton was that instead of letting the American public engage with the trauma of the event, or uh, the United States decided to sublimate it by going to war. Uh, and maybe this is you know, part of that sublimation process too, the construction of, of this kind of site. And then Martha Frisch asks in the same vein, um, you know, why is this urge for comfort and soothing so pervasive in American life? And uh, is there a way to for us to think about how to get this society to be more reflective. And why don't we just let everyone take it? We'll start with Sarah and then Harvey and then Rita, you can take the last word. Oh dear. <laughs> you can pass also. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think the answers are local answers. Uh, is there a way to get American society, America writ large? I mean, that, no, there isn't, but there is a way through local interventions like the last chapter with the Montgomery Monument, where you can say, you know, a lot of lynchings, thousands and thousands of people were murdered here and in this county and that county and that county. And so I think in a way you do it through this kind of abstract over time narrative avoidance that I've been talking about, but lots of local interventions. I, when I accused you of having said it, that your commentary about the uh, people coming together and all of the proposals and the activism around it um, was, I think, a kind of a participatory set of urgings. Um, and um, but but I think to the including that America is a funky democracy, and I think that if that funky means that uh, people can participate as they are and where they are, uh, of course, with all the other things going on, including real estate and power, but it means you're encouraged to have an opinion about the architecture and about this and about that and visit the gift shop. I mean, it's a very funky place. And I think this is the, in a way, sum total of all of those participatory elements, including the meaningless participation that we now see in retrospect, yeah. it, it was, that is now part of the record, that there were a million hearings. Uh, I think we're at a moment where we can see how uh, this desire for comfortableness is playing out in even more extreme ways. Uh, like critical race theory debate is basically like children should not be made to feel uncomfortable by uh, the facts of American history, right? 
And but I actually feel we're in a kind of last gasp moment of that. And some of that is generational and and that younger generations are much more comfortable with discomfort, let's just say, and with difference and with recognizing that those stories of the nation have a lot of really violent and and um, difficult stuff in, in them. And and so I I think what we're seeing now is this kind of insane push toward comfort that I I don't think can hold, right? Maybe it'll take another 10 years or another generation, right? Uh, But I think part of what we're seeing in a lot of the work on uh, racial justice and, and, with things like the uh, lynching memorial and the and the 1619 project, right? Part of what we're seeing is a push, push toward understanding that our history makes us uncomfortable, and to, and to actually engage with that instead of run away with it is important. And Brian Stevenson has this great quote that he uses a lot, where he says, "I'm not interested in, in." critiquing America, I want to liberate America by engaging with these difficult stories uh, of our history. Let's leave it there. Uh, Thank you to this terrific panel, Sarah, Harvey, and Marita for writing this book. Thanks to all of you who made it here in person and to those of you watching at Zoom. Don't forget that you can get a copy of Marita's book through a link that I think is on Zoom now. And uh, we look forward to seeing more of you here in person at future IPK events, we promise discomfort. Thanks very much.